Well, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to what I think is your last session at Cochrane. I hope you've enjoyed your time in Edinburgh. It's, it's a city that I've become very, very fond of, but it's not the city that, that I was born in. And um, if you want to see a real Scottish city and a better Scottish city... Where do you have a day? Spend a little bit of time in Glasgow before you go home. <laughs> So, so I'm going to speak to you this afternoon uh, about something which has become really, really important to both myself in Scotland, but, but actually the, the, the whole of the clinical community in, in Scotland. Um, it's a subject called realistic medicine. Before I do that, I want to declare some of my biases to you. So I'm a GP, and I'm going to tell you a story that starts to reveal some of perhaps my standpoint in clinical medicine. I was also the first person in my family ever to, to go to university, never mind undertake a career in medicine. So, so I came to it with very fresh ideas of, of what medicine involved. And I think I was inspired, particularly in those early years, by um, a, a GP who was a friend of my grandfather's and who just seemed to practice medicine in a way which was just so empathic and compassionate and so person-centred, and he was the person that, that I really wanted to, to try and emulate in my life. So I'm going to start with a story about a lady called Margaret. Margaret was one of my patients in the practice where I worked in Lark Hall. Lark Hall's a fairly deprived community in the west of Scotland. We had about 10,500 patients in that practice of five GPs. Margaret was in her early 90s. And she used to come and see me roughly on a monthly basis. She used to walk along to the end of a road and catch the bus down to the main street where our practice was and come in, sit for a little while in the waiting room, chatting, first of all, to the staff at the desk and then to the people who were waiting for their appointments. And then Margaret would come in and see me and she'd tell me about her knees Margaret suffered terrible discomfort in her knees. She had osteoarthritis. Her only medication that she took was paracetamol. And we would chat about things that she had done over the last month. We would chat about her family. We would sometimes chat about my family. I would lay my hand on her knee and I would examine it. Sometimes I would take her pulse. Sometimes I would take her blood pressure. And then, We'd have a conversation about her treatment, and we usually would agree that actually things were not too bad, and that the paracetamol was suiting her just fine, and she would go on her way until I saw her again in a month or so's time. Margaret's main issues were not medical issues. They were issues that mainly related to her social isolation. And that trip to the surgery every month was a big event in her life. On a Monday morning, I came in to the surgery to a discharge letter from the local hospital. Margaret had been admitted the week before. And on this discharge letter was her discharge diagnosis. It said, chest pain, query ischemic heart disease. And as I looked underneath that diagnosis, I saw that Margaret had been started on a long list of new medication. Bear in mind, Margaret was a pro approximately 94 or 95 at this time. And she'd been started on a statin, and she'd been started on two forms of antiplatelet therapy, plus a PPI to protect her stomach. She'd been started on antihypertensives, and she'd been given a nitrate, both oral and sublingual forms. Margaret's paracetamol had been changed to a compound analgesic called cocodamol, which is one which is particularly unpleasant in the elderly because of the side effects that it usually creates. And the last thing on Margaret's list was the fluoxetine that she had been started on to manage her low mood. She'd been in hospital for approximately three days. So I saw this discharge letter and I went up to visit Margaret. And the conversation that I had with her at that time was one of the most challenging conversations that I've ever had with a patient as I tried to speak to her about which of these medications would actually make 
a meaningful impact to her and to her symptoms for the future. But eventually we agreed that perhaps not all of them were necessary and that we could start to rationalize them. Why do I tell you this story? I tell you this story because it reveals some of my biases, but also because I think it highlights a problem in medicine that we really need to try to address if we're to practice truly meaningful medicine in the future. This chart shows the growth in Scotland's population by age group between the years 2010 and 2035. The most striking feature of this is that those in Margaret's age group over 75s will increase by 82% during that time. But you'll also notice that during that same period, the people who are in our society who are most likely to provide care and to be employed, that population reduces during that time. And of course, as people get older, generally, they tend to collect more and more medical conditions. This comes from a landmark study by Stuart Mercer and his team, 2012, which is one of my favorite graphs that I like to show, because it shows to me starkly the burden of multimorbidity within our communities across Scotland. What it doesn't show is that there are actually more people living with multimorbidity in Scotland under the age of 65 than over the age of 65. And that those multimorbidities tend to develop on average 10 to 15 years earlier in our more deprived communities where poor mental health is a much more common feature of those multimorbidities as well. And of course, you can't escape debate about the role of guidelines. Now, guidelines have made enormous improvements to the way that we approach and manage particularly chronic um, long-term conditions. But I was speaking at a conference just last week at Guidelines International Network, and it couldn't escape attention that actually there are very few guidelines which recognize this multimorbidity that we have in our society, and it becomes incredibly difficult to try to prioritize where we should give our energy and our time when we are speaking to patients about their care. One of our responses to this in Scotland has been a conversation that we started three years ago with the profession around the concept we called realistic medicine. Now at its heart, realistic medicine is about the way that we create relationships between those who give care and those who receive care. And also the way that those relationships can develop between those people who give care as well. It's about the quality of the roles of the relationships. It's about trying to achieve a much more equal balance in terms of that power dynamic that exists between patients and particularly doctors, but not exclusively. When we started this conversation, we wanted to open a dialogue because we felt that this was a conversation that was happening up and down the country, in hospitals, in theatres, in GP surgeries. And we wanted to expose it and give it some credibility. But we didn't realise just what a response that we would get when we started this. And we framed it around these six questions you see here. Can we change our style to share decision making? Can we build a personalised approach to care? Can we reduce harm and waste? reduce unwarranted variation in practice and outcomes? Can we manage risk better? And can we become improvers and innovators? Since that time, we've produced two subsequent reports because, as I say, the support that we've had from this from the community in Scotland has been really quite overwhelming. We've tried to create national conditions where that culture and style of practice is one which can flourish. And earlier this year, we, practiced, we published the third report, Practicing Realistic Medicine, which starts to highlight some of the examples of where this style of practice is really beginning to change and grab hold in Scotland. At its basis, as healthcare professionals, first of all, we must listen to our patients and listen to understand. Find out what matters most to them. The most important question we can ask our patients these days is what matters to you? and help them make an informed choice. And that means that the way that we frame those conversations has to be in a way that people can properly understand. We need to address not just under-treatment within our society, but also the spectre of over-treatment. 
One of the pieces of evidence that we came across as we were writing the first report was actually the different attitudes of doctors when faced with the same decisions that they speak to their patients about. How 95% of doctors at the end of their life would opt not to have CPR. 88% would opt not to have hemodialysis. And yet some of these people were the very people who were having those same conversations with their patients and guiding them towards that treatment. And the reasons for that are very, very complex. We must challenge variation in clinical practice, identify the unwarranted variation that exists, and we must seek at all times to offer higher value care. Care that is going to make a meaningful impact on people's lives, not just in terms of clinical impact, but as I say, in what matters to them as well. So this is our shared vision in Scotland that we aim to achieve by 2025, that everyone who provides healthcare in Scotland will demonstrate their professionalism through the approaches, the behaviours and the attitudes of realistic medicine. This is a cultural piece of work. This is trying to reshape people's approach to the way that they um, deliver the care to people of Scotland. As I say, at its heart is, lies good communication. Not just asking the right questions, but listening to understand the answers that people give. We know that people want to take part in these conversations. We've surveyed our citizens' panel of over a thousand people, and consistently, nine out of ten people want to be a part of these conversations, feel comfortable about being a part of these conversations, but less of them feel able to actually be a part of that. Why is that? Again, we go back to this power dynamic that exists within the relationships. So this is all about how we improve those relationships. We also must understand that there are obstacles in the way. One of those, one of the greatest of those, is actually the varied level of health literacy within our population. Now, in Scotland, I'm sure we're no different from many countries, but actually many within our population have very low levels of health literacy. And it doesn't necessarily fix that those with the lowest level of educational attainment also have the lowest level of health literacy. We should never assume that just because someone's educated that actually they've got a much greater understanding of the decisions that relate to their care as well. We've now produced our second action plan on health literacy called Making It Easier. One of the drives that we'll be undertaking over this next two to three year period is how we put in place the foundation stone of improving health literacy across our population. One of the attempts to do that that we'll be, un we'll be undertaking later on this year is our first citizen's jury on um, a health issue. And that's how we fully undertake shared decision making. What are the conditions that are necessary in order that people can feel that they're a part of that shared decision making? That will begin in October and we're committed to um, receiving the recommendations from that citizen's jury and acting upon those. One of the things that I hear reflected to me by clinicians often is, is, is this fear of, of varying and, and, and departing from guidelines. But if you look back to some of the original work about evidence-based medicine, I don't believe that evidence-based medicine can truly occur unless you've got these three elements in balance. Of course we need the scientific evidence, but it needs to be relevant to that individual. And real world evidence is an area where I'm becoming particularly interested in, in, in how we can make sure that it applies to these kind of comorbid populations that we've got. But we need to apply that by properly eliciting patients' values and preferences and using our clinical judgment in those scenarios as well. John Kinsella is the chair of the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network. They produce our national guidelines and He's got very strong views on this as well, and, and we've had many conversations about this, and in our last report, he allowed us to quote him um, to say that actually it's okay not to follow a guideline at times, provided the reasons are well documented, because sometimes things for the majority of people wouldn't be advised, and for some it might be okay. One of the first things that I became involved with in this sphere was actually shortly after hearing Victor Montori speak in Washington and it was the development of poly, National Polypharmacy Guideline in 2012. Uh, polypharmacy is, like many kind of Western um, societies, is a real problem for us. Um, it's been driven by all sorts of factors, not, 
least of which was the unintended consequences of the quality and outcomes framework within Scotland and, and the rest of the UK. Since we produced those first guidelines in 2012, we have adapted those. And when we published our third guidance in 2018, the biggest change and the biggest difference that had come about was that these were very much now holistic, patient-centred guidelines. It was the patient who was driving the conversation rather than the clinician. A seven-step process supported by presenting evidence in a way that was understandable, using um, ways of trying to describe that evidence, such as number needed to treat, using um, charts for toxicity um, and cumulative toxicity of, um, of different types of medication, to try to present things in a way that people could understand and fully participate in that conversation. Later on this year, we've already released a, a clinically centred um, mobile phone app for people to use and, and support these conversations. But later on this year, we'll release a patient centred or a patient facing app so that they can fully take part in those conversations as well. What's interesting is that since we in introduced this guidance, if you look at the predicted path of our prescribing growth over that period compared to what it's really been, we've probably um, led to about 1.2 million fewer items prescribed during that time than the predicted path that, that we were following at that time. We've now had about um, uh, roughly about 120,000 consultations per year um, centered around polypharmacy reviews, and each one of those consultations uh, on average leads to um, around two medications being stopped. As I say, we have apps that are available to support um, the conversations um, and desktop uh, pages as well, where you'll see some of the, the, the different guides that are contained within it. But really what we want to take this into in the next iteration is, is to be a completely accessible uh, information so that people can feel completely part of that conversation and indeed lead that conversation. Another aspect of realistic medicine is a review of consent. In the UK, um, there was a landmark ruling um, about three years ago, the Montgomery ruling, which changed our whole approach to consent. And we're in the process of reviewing the guidance that we give to clinicians around about what really makes up informed consent in light of that, working with the General Medical Council and with Academy of Medical Royal College so that we can provide guidance, again, not only to clinicians, but to patients um, about where we take consent in the future. And one of the really interesting areas that we're now exploring is how we use requests for treatment as a mechanism of consent, um, particularly around about those kind of procedures that might be considered discretionary rather than essential. We're also using different tools in the consultation. So this is the Choosing Wisely five questions that many of you will be familiar with. But we now have um, kind of cards and posters in our waiting rooms where we're testing this in five health boards across Scotland, evaluating um, what is the quality of the conversation that we have within that environment with our patients. Does it change our approach to shared decision making if we can empower patients to feel much more fully involved and able to ask these questions? And so far, the results of the early evaluation are really interesting in that we're starting to see um, a, a different approaches, both in terms of patients more willing to use these questions, but also our clinicians much more um, willing and able to participate in those type of conversations as well. But to do that properly, we need to make sure patients are equipped for those conversations. I think one of the things that Cochrane can do for us is to be able to distill evidence in a way that allows us to make that evidence accessible for people. And we're working with Scottish libraries, both within the NHS, but also within local authorities to be trusted um, stewards, sources of information so that um, when people have these conversations, they know that they can turn to these sources of information to try and give them more um, help um, in, in coming to some of the decisions that they're making. Um, some of the early promise around about this is really fascinating in terms of librarians working with patients, researching different topics for them so that when they go back to kind of uh, make decisions about their treatment plans, they're, they're going back in 
um, with much, much more um, information which is understandable in their context um, so that they can have fully informed conversations with the clinicians. And we recognise that that also needs a different style of practice and consultation. So we're working with um, our higher education institutes, our medical schools, our um, royal colleges, um, and indeed our national organisation for education in healthcare, NES, um, to, to look at how we can shape the modern curriculum in Scotland so that it's much more relevant to the realistic medicine philosophy that we're trying to achieve. As I say, one of the things that we've had um, thrown at us most often from clinicians is, yeah, it's okay for you to say it, stand there and say that, that this is the way we want to practice. But I feel exposed when I practice that way. I feel as though I'm at greater risk of the medical legal consequences if I depart from guidelines and evidence. So we've engaged with some of our medical legal experts across Scotland, and we've engaged with the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman, the person who, uh, if you like, is the last arbitrator for, for patient complaints. And they're very, very clear that actually this style of practice, rather than exposing people to the risk of litigation, is actually much, much more protective. Because most of the complaints that they see, most of the litigation that they have to deal with, actually at its core is the poor communication that exists, particularly about the choices. And so we think that actually this is a risk that although understandably some people feel, we don't think that it's a, a real risk and that by practicing in this way, actually it's a, it's, it's, it reduces that risk as well. As I say, one of the, the, the real things that we wanted to try to do was to tackle unwarranted variation, harm and waste within our system. Earlier today, we published our first atlas of variation within Scotland. This has been something which has been um, in the development for, for, for many, many months. We've, we've learned from the seat of um, kind of many people who've gone before us, such as um, Jack Wenberg and Muir Gray, uh, from examples of atlases around the world in New Zealand and in Australia. And we now have our first three maps and a publicly accessible web-based atlas of variation. Now, it's really, really important. This atlas of variation only exposes the differences across the country. It doesn't tell us or anything or make any judgment about the quality of care. It can do. What it does is it shines a light on where those differences exist, where that variation exists. It doesn't even tell us whether that variation is warranted or unwarranted. And of course, it's the unwarranted variation that we want to try to identify. So what we need to make sure that we do is to use this tool in a very responsible way when we consider this data, to have the conversations that help us to understand why that variation exists and where that variation is identified as being unwarranted, either because of inadequate pathway development or clinically led preference, is to have those conversations in a way that help us to tackle that. We want to promote what we're calling value-based healthcare, because of course we can have high quality care which is, isn't appropriate because it's aimed at the wrong person and provides low value care. What we mean by that is it actually provides very little benefit to that individual. And of course this chart which you see here from Donna Beedie is one of the most famous charts in medicine, I think, and it demonstrates that actually as you put more resource into a healthcare system, you tend to get rising benefit from that resource but a plateau occurs. Now, in the meantime, as you undertake more and more healthcare, because it's inherently risky, the risk of harm increases during that time. And there comes a point in time where actually the benefits to your population start to drop off and fall. And what we want to try to do by using these maps is to try and find that optimal point where the value that we're providing to our patients um, is as good as it possibly can be. The atlases start to reveal some differences, as, as I say, in terms of the way that the care is delivered. Um, but, but it's only the differences that they, they begin to reveal. Here you see an example of um, elective primary knee replacement across Scotland, where there's a 2.3-fold variation um, across different health boards. That doesn't tell us what the right rate is. It only tells us that there's variation. So in order to understand that better, we need to make sure that people are equipped to have the conversations. 
One of the ways that we can do that is to make sure that we've got the best data available and we've introduced this resource to general practice in Scotland, the Scottish Primary Care Information Resource. Essentially it's a tool that sits behind GP electronic patient systems and is able to suck information from those systems. It's designed to help professionals and researchers to learn from the information, the really rich coded information that exists within those GP practices. It allows GP practices to monitor patients better. So for instance, it allows perhaps the identification of people with particularly uh, um, risky combinations of polypharmacy and to have the conversations with them about what needs to happen. And also makes easier for the NHS to plan services around about um, the, the local needs of those populations as well. So for instance, one of the early things that we've done with those practices is we've provided them with um, poly, sorry, the multimorbidity data for their own practice, um, which is both at a practice level, but aggregated to actually the, the, the kind of local community level as well, so that services and service planning can actually start to take in uh, to account the, 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 kind of eight, the different levels of multimorbidity and disease burden within those areas. And when you aggregate those up to a national level, you start to see where the burden of disease in Scotland is. This was work undertaken by the Public Health Observatory in Scotland in 2015. And you can see that for us in Scotland, the really big three for us, no surprise, is cardiovascular disease, cancer, but perhaps surprisingly just the, to the extent of the mental and substance use disorders. Because traditionally this has been an area which has been maybe a Cinderella specialty. And so one of our clinical priority areas and one of our areas for, um, to prioritise improvement and planning around about now um, is around about how we improve mental health services in Scotland. The last aspect I want to touch upon today is actually the, the recognition and the need for a different type of research. And we've worked with the Scottish School of Primary Care, um, led by Professor Stuart Mercer from Glasgow, um, around about a concept called middle ground research, because the research which, uh, the kind of pure RCT research is all well and good, but perhaps in this really complex society that we have now and complex care that we provide, we need a different type of research that we've, as I say, given this term, middle ground research. And it's, it's a research which has academics, service, and, and policy makers working much, much more closely together with rapid cycles of research, particularly around about implementation and evaluation, which allows us very quickly to get a sense of um, whether a particular approach is successful and working as it's intended. And one of the things that we've done with the Real Estate Medicine Programme is to embed researchers within our policy team so that we um, are in the process of developing a strategic research plan over the next three to five years um, based on clinical research, social research, and also um, uh, health finance research as well uh, to try to uh, assess the impact of the measures that we're trying to take. And embedding real estate medicine across Scotland is, of course, something which is a kind of shared endeavour for us. I've mentioned that as a variation, but we also know that real estate medicine leads, both financial leads and clinical leads, working shoulder to shoulder across every health board in Scotland. Um, today saw the closing of an application for funding for value improvement projects. Um, I'm delighted by the number of applications that we've had for this small amount of money that we've made available to teams to try to undertake these projects to improve the, the value of care within the different areas. We've also been working with um, some kind of international experts on, on value improvement training for these guys. And, and, and the last aspect of this, which is really quite exciting for us, is the development of a single national formulary, which will come in to introduction within Scotland in the early part of 2019. So that's a very rapid run through of some of the, the, the kind of measures that we're taking in Scotland to try and deliver a, a different approach to medicine. It's an exciting, it's a cultural piece. Um, we've termed it realistic medicine. I think the descriptor is, is about taking a different approach where we are very much more trying to achieve a, a much more equal relationship uh, with our patients and, and to try and drive forward care in a way that's it's co-produced. So thank you very much.
thank you very much for this opportunity. And it's hard to, to follow uh, Dr. Smith and his uh, presentation. Uh, two of my slides, actually, that I removed at the last minute, you've presented, so I actually feel very lucky. Um, the bottom of the slide has the code for the questions, so if you want to submit questions at the end. Um, this is my email address. I respond to email, and that's the Twitter handle in case you want to share with the outside world. Um, I started my research career in 1998, and the first project that I participated in was a Cochrane review. So it's actually, I'm extremely proud to, be, to have the opportunity to, have, uh, to be able to speak to you today. I know in this room are people who feel the mission of this collaboration as something quite personal. And I want to tell you from the outside world that that is very appreciated. Um, and from the start of that beginning, of that, of that journey, uh, we decided that we would not take any uh, for-profit uh, funding to conduct our research, which allows me to have this slide as the start of my talk. Um, that is not completely true that I have any disclosures because as, as um, Martin just mentioned, since October of last year, we published this book, but all the profits from the, actually all the proceeds from the book go to fund an organization called The Patient Revolution, which is trying to bring some of the ideas of the book uh, to, 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 to bear, to practice. Some of those ideas I'm going to be discussing now, um, and so that's what I'm mentioning it today, but I don't get any personal profit from either the organization or the book. Three phrases that you have heard during this week and you may have heard before, um, I think are the, the place where I would like to start this conversation with you. The first one is better evidence for better decisions. It's right over there. Right? The second one is sometimes recognized as the second principle of evidence-based care or evidence-based medicine. Uh, the evidence alone never tells us what to do. And the third one is a challenge that has been repeated in many of the sessions in this colloquium, which is the challenge of translating evidence into practice. Those phrases have one thing in common, and the one thing they have in common is they start the thinking process about the challenges and the issues that, that they refer to from evidence, and then place care or clinical practice towards care as the consequence, as the subsequent uh, aspect that follows getting the evidence right. The graphics, for instance, used to describe the trans process of translation of evidence into practice imply a major challenge in the quality of the healthcare delivery system in that we have all this evidence being pushed down and somehow it doesn't arrive towards, the right, to your, towards your right. It doesn't arrive, at, it doesn't get translated into better care. If we just get this evidence right and we just get the system right, care will be better. And in fact, I would put forward that this way of thinking, the starting with the evidence, is problematic. It, for instance, leads to some uh, graphics uh, and, and, and depictions and frameworks of evidence. For instance, this one, which is a, the extremely uh, helpful and, and visionary idea of an evidence ecosystem. But if you look at that evidence ecosystem, the problems that that evidence is being designed to answer are not in the ecosystem. They're not part of the description of the problem or the process of the solution. So this divorce between the evidence producers, the evidence synthesizers, the evidence packagers, the evidence disseminators, and those who are at the front line trying to take care of patients creates a problem and we think if we just push harder, then we might actually just get it to work. I would put forward in this presentation that we have it wrong. We have, the, we have it the other way around. It is not that better evidence will improve better, will lead to better care. It's that the main problem that we have in healthcare today is to get to be, to be able to care with evidence. We need to care, we need care that draws from evidence. The fundamental problem is care and evidence is just one of the tools that actually helps us get it right. So when we start our phrases and our thinking with evidence, we're going to immediately put a separation, a distance, a trajectory between our work and the care of patients. And I think that will reduce our ability to, to serve them. And I will invite us to begin to flip that arrow around and start always at the problems, and usually it's the problems of our populations or the problems of our patients. So we need to think about how do we make it is not about evidence-based care, but how do we make it about evidence-based care? So let's start with, uh, with Maria Luisa. So Maria Luisa is Peruvian, like I am, like 
like are the best restaurants in Chile as well, when you go next year. <laughs> You're welcome uh, for the other best. <laughs> So Maria Luisa is from Peru. She actually does not live in Peru. She lives in Anchorage, Alaska with her son and two daughters. Uh, she doesn't speak English, so these are the people that she mostly talks to, sometimes uh, on the phone with her family in Peru. What do you see? Do you see a picture of health? What do you see in her eyes? What do you see in her face? Sad. Sad. What else? Sorry? Lonely, yes. What else? Worried. Worried. Keep going. Contemplative, weak. Contemplative, weak. Keep going. Anxious. Sorry? Defeat. Yeah. Defeat. Defeat. Overwhelmed. Yeah. Nobody's, nobody's claiming that she's doing well. And that's just by looking at her. When I show this to a room full of dermatologists, the only thing they see is that thing on her face. It's a, <laughs> I, I can get, I, I get nothing from that audience. And it's just, but when Maria Luisa comes to see us, um, we, we don't see a patient with a, with a problem. As, as Gregor has shown us, when patients get to a certain age, the most common situation is that they live with multimorbidity. In fact, that paper demonstrates that the average middle-aged person no longer is a healthy person, but the average middle-aged person is a person that lives with at least one chronic condition. And so as we attend to, to her, we must take into account a significant increase in the complexity of the patients that we see, complexity that is contributed by issues of biology, like obesity or frailty, in addition to the fact that they have multiple chronic conditions. And the way we respond to that is problematic. We respond to it with specialty care, which requires that we put people in a particular back bucket, in a particular category. Maria Lisa has to be a patient with diabetes so that the diabetes quality framework can apply to her. It has to be a patient with depression or has to be a patient with heart failure so that the cardiologist will see her. But these, these categories are very challenging uh, as a way of guiding our care when patients present with such a complex biology. And in fact, the response is that Maria Luisa is not only overwhelmed and sad and lonely, but is overwhelmed, sad and lonely, surrounded by a significant amount of health care. Now, some of you might say, hey, we should, that's probably not all evidence-based. You know, we should have, we can probably get her treatment trimmed down if these were all the medications that uh, had good randomized trial evidence around it. But the challenge is, as it is the challenge for, for your patient with a knee problem, is that you know, that's, that may be the, the medicine that is supported by randomized trials, but so maybe that one, and 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 that one. And of course, there'll be some observational studies thrown in for diet, you know, like <laughs> what, whether coffee's good and chocolate is good and that sort of thing. So, so the application of evidence doesn't care. Evidence doesn't care. And if we say, well, maybe it's because you're looking at all the individual pieces, but what about guidelines? And of course, the guidelines are also uh, prepared by patient. And so when you apply them, all the relevant guidelines that apply to a particular patient like Maria Luisa, you get in trouble with drug disease and drug-drug interactions. And um, this trouble is made worse by the fact that you're trying just to respond to the biology. But our patients don't have complexity just coming from their biology. They have complexity also coming from their biography. Material deprivation, loneliness, Somebody picked that up from the picture. And like Maria, Maria Luisa feeling stuck at some sort of dead end in their life without much meaning or sources of joy. And as clinicians at the front line to care for Maria Luisa, we have to be able to oscillate our gaze between the, her biology and her biography if we want to take care of her rather than take care of people like her. Now, the problem is that in our healthcare system, at least in the one that, that where I come from, we have a substantial problem. And the substantial problem can be characterized in multiple ways. This is one of the ways. So on the one part, we have clinicians who are uh, uh, burned out. There's a high prevalence of clinicians who have lost a sense of mission, who have callous and a loss of empathy and symptoms of burnout. Some estimates put it at a third. Some estimates put it at half of the frontline clinicians in, unable to emotionally connect with the patients that they have in front. Furthermore, patients are a blur. They come in too fast. We only have a few minutes to see them. Sometimes we see them too close as a biopsy result or a test result, and we don't get to see the full patient. 
sometimes we see them as a statistic. The patient with diabetes in which we have to satisfy the quality metrics and we, for, we miss the person. The patient's as a blur, connecting with a sense of a clinician at a loss. And then as they come together, they don't have much of an opportunity to bring up the agenda. We interrupt patients now about 11 seconds after they begin to tell us why they're there, which creates a very limited opportunity for us to understand why they need us. But on top of that, to cope, we introduce guidelines that tell us how to treat different groups. We introduce targets for our disease uh, process. We actually uh, offer shared decision making or intensify the treatment. But all of these approaches are approaches for people like Maria Luisa. They're not approaches for Maria Luisa. And the job, the job of care, is to care for Maria Luisa, not for people like Maria Luisa. So one of the consequences of this um, uh, disease-focused, context-blind approach is what you've seen in, in Maria Luisa, a complex treatment program without prioritization and coordination that overwhelms patients and overwhelms families. And when you're overwhelmed, you have a negative impact of our treatments on your quality of life, and that is a treatment burden. Now, how much is the treatment burden? Estimates have been used. Uh, here, I'm gonna show you a few estimates. Here are a couple of estimates. If you have three chronic conditions, you're taking six medications a day, visiting six, uh, clinicians six times a month, and then spending about 60 hours a month uh, in your healthcare. If you have six conditions, it goes up. It doesn't go, go up exponentially, but it goes up to about 18 medications, seven visits, and 80 hours a month. It's a part-time job. Here's another view of the same data. Uh, telling you which kinds of things are happening during those hours. And in blue is the work of uh, filling and refilling and using medications. In yellow is getting therapies unsupervised, so in other words, diet, exercise, that sort of thing that people do. In red, uh, observed therapies, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and in green, doctor's visits. So you can see how as diseases accumulate on the x-axis, the amount of time spent, particularly in self-care, needs to go up. We asked patients in our diabetes clinic to take pictures of the burden of treatment, and, and this is, these are a few pictures that our patients took. These are patients with diabetes, so you see, for instance, things like choosing what to eat become really important, and interpreting uh, food labels becomes an important part of their work. Dealing with interfaces, so in this case, this is a, an insulin pen, dealing with the interfaces. In this case, it's a glucose meter. This was, was not work of, me, of measuring the sugar, which is quite significant, but it's the fact that in the United States, when your insurance coverage changes, the benefit managers um, also change their, they have different contracts for different providers of glucometers. So a patient gets a free glucometer sent to their home, but each glucometer has a completely new interface that they have to learn. And all the little strips that you see there to check your sugars have to be thrown away because a new set of strips is now necessary. And so he was pointing that out, that out to us. Many patients took pictures like this. That the work that they are, they're faced with is a work of waiting and waiting and waiting some more usually against an empty wall, and maybe the doctor will come in soon, maybe in a few minutes. Just wait a little more. This is not a hospital, this is somebody's house, and these are the insulin pump supplies, and they have to keep separate space for these sorts of things. And this is a patient who had it all well managed and well coordinated, and then she had an accident, and now she's dependent on others, and she's slow to move around, and things are out of whack. Because when you care for, for chronic conditions, the, the treatment of the chronic condition has to weave in with all the other demands in your life. And this is somebody's diary where you can see appointments and speech therapy and going to see this and picking up the groceries and picking up the kids and all of these things happening one on top of the other so that they can get the care that they need. And 75% of our patients with diabetes are reporting high and unsustainable levels of treatment burden. In other words, if this continues, I will not be able to do everything that I'm being asked to do. Now, one of the challenges I think that we see uh, with, with care is the, the issue that the evidence from which we draw to actually make the care work out have to be trustworthy. And we have problems. And we all in this room, I think, are quite familiar with the corruption of the evidence that occurs as we go from production to publication and dissemination. And I think that this is a very good graph to teach that to others if they are not aware how perhaps we have a mixed bag of antidepressant 
uh, uh, benefit, and then as with publication bias and outcome reporting bias and spin and selective citation, you can make something that looks like a mixed bag look incredibly favorable, which that distorts the record and actually may produce an increased level of enthusiasm for interventions that perhaps won't work. And I think we all have to commit to independently produced research. We have to commit to error-proofed uh, uh, research. We have to commit to spin-free research. And we have to commit to fully reported research. We all have an obligation to advocate for these things, to make sure that when um, Maria Luisa's clinician is thinking about care for Maria Luisa, they not end up overwhelming her with care that doesn't apply to her. Some of the significant challenges of starting with evidence is that then the questions that then get to be answered are questions that come from knowledge gaps. And then we have all this evidence that nobody picks up. So we need our questions to come from care gaps. And one of the sources, for instance, the, the Linda Lyons, you know, when they look at the kinds of priorities their patients have and the kinds of coverage to those questions that trials have, the proportion is very, very small. We still have a big industry of trials and evidence that is responding to other needs, not the needs of our patients. They're not addressing care gaps. And so we need research that is useful, not just trustworthy, but useful. And what is useful research? Is research that is responsive to the conditions, the practical conditions of each of our patients. Not just the disease that they have, but the disease that they have in the context of all the other conditions, in the context of their biology and their biography. It has to be directly applicable to those circumstances, which is a big challenge, and perhaps the only answer is gonna be massive, large-scale evidence, like the kind you help produce by aggregating evidence and reviews. And of course, it has to be practical. It has to respond to the individual, to the challenges of care. So, in order for research to be useful, we need to switch this direction. We need to switch the direction from evidence to, to care and start from care and then develop the evidence. And that requires a significant change in the way we, we care. I think we have to recognize the, the enlightened approach that uh, the, uh, the Scottish folks are, are taking. Uh, with realistic medicine, because it is that kind of approach that may open the opportunities to begin to generate evidence that is useful. It has to be participatory. Patients, uh, citizens, clinicians at the front line, they, they'll have to build into their routines the collection of, of data, not in observational ways that we're going to have a lot of difficulty interpreting, but in the participation of simple trials in the practice, which requires an integration of electronic records and practice that, that is very difficult to do without interrupting the process of care. It cannot be a trade-off. It has to be an end. It has to be collaborative in that in that way, it has to be done in context so that it, you don't have problems of uh, application. And it will have to be multi-methods. It was actually quite nice to have a whole session by the other Peruvian keynote speaker um, in, in which the qualitative research actually was, was pointed out. Because this, in order to completely understand biology and biography, their interface, the application of evidence in context, we need to understand how things are, are, are happening in people's lives. And, and qualitative research combined with the quantitative research is going to give us that answer. But that's not enough. That's not enough. When our patients tell us they have overwhelming levels of health care and they are not healthier, and our most measured response is to call them non-compliant when they don't do everything we ask them to do. We have a big problem of care. And it doesn't matter how much evidence we produce and how well we synthesize it and how well we disseminate it. If the uptake of that evidence is the possibility of using evidence to care is broken because we cannot care anymore, because the system in which we are uh, helping people is broken. So we need to go away from industrial health care and move to careful and kind care. In careful and kind care, the agenda will be left open to respond to the problems of this patient, not of patients like uh, him or her. The situation of the patient will be appreciated in its biology and its biography, because the clinicians will be trained to do so, because they'll have, have time to do so, and because the citizens will have the expectation that they will be seen as a full person when they come for care. 
And the purpose of this interaction will not be the translation of evidence into practice, the checking of the box of the quality measures, the, the achievement of the industrial goals of the system, but rather the, the identification of a solution that makes sense. Intellectually, patients can understand it and see why it's uh, good for them. Clinicians can understand it with them. Emotionally, they, they feel it's the right thing to do. And practically, that they can weave it in into the routines of their lives. This is what care should look like. And just as we advocate for trustworthy and useful evidence, we have another challenge as, as members of this collaboration, is that we have to advocate that the systems of care that serve our citizens, that serve our family, are systems of careful and kind care. And our language has to reflect that shift from evidence to practice to practice to evidence. And for instance, the second rule or the second principle of evidence-based medicine should not be that evidence alone never tells you what to do, but it should be that the situation alone never tells you what to do. Trustworthy and useful, useful evidence could help. So the way forward to achieve that, it requires us to check our principles, check our values. We need to think about whether we want systems of care that are corrupted by greed, or whether we want systems of care and evidence that are motivated by solidarity. So all these discussions about conflict of interest and challenges in believing the evidence and things like that, if you ask the five whys, the last why, the answer is often greed. We need to fundamentally change that and look to create an ecosystem of evidence producing solidarity and an ecosystem of care that reflects the solidarity of our societies. It has to be driven by integrity, not by regulations, not by incentives. There's nothing more sad than people who claim to be professionals driven by financial incentives to do one thing or the other, as if there were, you know, Skinnerian rats on the box, you know, following the cheese. It's disrespectful to our professionals to treat them that, that way, and it's sad when they allow themselves to be, to be treated that way and, to re, and when they respond to incentives instead of being re, responsive to their integrity. We need to recover that as part of the way of recovering half of our uh, frontline clinicians from uh, the deaths of depression and, and burnout. We need to turn away from efficiency you see, definitions of value become really important. When you say you want a high-value healthcare system, you have to be clear about what you mean by value and value for whom. But one of the ways in which people interpret value is as efficiency. You do not want waste, and you want good return for the investment. But efficiency should not be the characteristic of good healthcare. The characteristic of good healthcare should be elegance. You should, there should not be any waste, but there should not be any haste. Think about a gymnast or a ballet dancer. There's no wasted move, but there's also a pace, a way of doing things that is the right rhythm, the right place to put the right foot in the right place. It responds to what needs to happen, and it doesn't waste, but it also doesn't hurry. And healthcare should be, ref should be reflective of not an efficient machine, but an elegant system of humans. It should be capable of caring for this patient, not for patients like this, as we discussed today. And it should be able to do so through relationships. And you've made a very good point about the importance of basing things on relationships, because as the majority of our patients are going to be uh, uh, troubled by chronic ongoing conditions, fixing them is not going to be an option. They're going to live with these conditions and with the treatments, and we're going to be joining them in their challenge. And we need to be prepared for uh, situations that are going to disappoint. And the best way to respond to disappointments and to help patients be resilient to those disappointments is in the strength of the relationships that they have with other patients and with their clinicians. So we need a system based on those relationships so that uh, we can do this well. A system based on transactions with no continuity and nothing, those, is, those um, moments of, uh, of trial will be faced with a stranger and loneliness will follow. We need to move to evidence-based care. Evidence-based is an adjective. I would like to say care is the, is the noun, um, but let's think of it as, as the verb. It's what we do with people. 
So careful and kind care is what happened to Maria Luisa when her granddaughter, who did research with us for a couple of years, went to visit her in Anchorage and found her like you saw in that picture, overwhelmed by healthcare, but not healthier. She noticed that her days were shortened in part because she was afraid to go up down the stairs. And when her family was le left the house for work, she was alone. She was worried that she would fall down the stairs. And so they installed one of these elevators and that uh, released her from the prison of the second floor. Here's uh, Anna, uh, now a, a physician in training in emergency medicine on the right with her grandmother. Maria Luisa went to dialysis three times a week. And uh, she moved the dialysis time to the afternoon, hoping that the mornings could become helpful to her because she knew that when she was coming back from dialysis, she was completely wiped out. She was very fatigued. She got lucky in the afternoon. Two of the nurses in the dialysis center spoke Spanish. And so a little bit of her social world expanded. But she also did something that was actually quite genius. You need to take note of that, these Chilean people. Um, <laughs> she actually contacted a dietitian in Peru and sent her the instructions of the very rigorous diet that because of all her comorbidities she had to follow. And the dietitian in Peru sent back recipes with Peruvian flavors that adhere to some extent to the requirements of that diet. And she found somebody in Anchorage that could cook that for her for every week. So Maria Luisa could actually enjoy those beautiful Peruvian flavors without having to cheat on the essentially cardboard diet that she was given uh, to try to cope with her condition. And little by little, Maria Luisa got health, a better ability to cope, and perhaps enough ability to thrive, to be able to fly back to Peru, turn out for the last time, and enjoy uh, and the food. The reason you spend night after night completing those reviews, getting the evidence right, focusing on the rigor, is that somebody somewhere can draw from that work that you all do and do this. And by this, of course, I don't mean the fish. I mean the smile on her face. I mean the smile on her face. And how do we get that smile on her face? We Cochrane. Thank you very much for your attention. Let's do some questions. So, questions in the room if there are any, but our visitor, our visitors may not know. We're also having people tweeting in questions with mentee. And so, yes, please. So, uh, Jack, come and tell us what's, what questions you have. OK, uh, Sally had to leave early, so I've been uh, swiftly promoted. Um, so this is a question for the, the entire panel, actually, I think, to start off with. So the question says, it often takes long to not do something rather than to do something in medicine. So how can we give enough time to clinicians to have a richer, more nuanced conversations? And I suppose maybe thinking as well, what, us in the room and patients as well specifically, it would be uh, good for the folks of this conference, yeah. Gregor, do you want to go first? So, so I'm happy to go first. I mean, that, that's a really common comment that, that, that I hear when I speak about realistic medicine. And, and as I say, I, I think it, it would be wrong of us not to acknowledge just how challenging it is to practice any kind of clinical specialty just now because um, we, we all know just how complex um, that, that is. So the way I would frame that is if, if I told you a story about when I joined a general practice, when I joined, they tended to see 60 patients. Each doctor saw 60 patients on a Monday. They saw 20 in the morning, they saw 40 in the afternoon. And they split those appointments up. They usually varied between five minutes and seven and a half minutes. And when I looked at the, type, the way that those patients were being dealt with, what was happening was the same patients were coming back in two to three days later because they were never able to fully deal or explore the needs that those patients were bringing to them. So I managed to take a leap of faith and convince them that actually if we used the broader team that we had in the practice and if we extended the amount of appointments that we had, maybe, just maybe, we would fully be able to deal with the problems that were brought to us at that single point in time. And that's exactly what happened. We gave ourselves more time. There was less waste within the consultation. We stopped bringing people back because we felt as though we were only going partly through or because people felt as though we weren't dealing with the reasons that they'd come. And, and, and the world didn't collapse around about us. Now, I get that it's tough now, but actually we've got an opportunity to use extended teams now, not just people with a clinical professional background, but actually people with lived experience, people who are really skilled in developing trust 
in developing um, a conversation with people so that we can really elicit from individuals what matters to them and why they've sought help. And if we do that properly, it means that eventually when they're seeing a nurse or a physiotherapist or a doctor within the system, the conversations that we're having there can be as meaningful as possible and built around about that shared understanding. Thank you. Uh, yeah, okay. I have a, a, a different take. So, um, uh, time is often an excuse. I'm not saying that as, as, therefore, it's not valid. I'm just saying that it's used as an explanation for a number of shortcomings of our ability to care. And time is accepted as it shrinks uh, in, in response to demand. Uh, it's, accept, it, it can, it, it's allowed to shrink to ever lower levels. There's no pushback from the profession that I've seen almost. There are a few, uh, in some countries in Europe, I know there's been some, some uh, uh, collective action from professions to say, you know, I think in Spain they had a campaign no less than 10 at some point. But it's essentially been quite, it's been quite quiet. Uh, the assumption that we can take care of people in very short periods of time. And um, I think it's, a, it's like many other problems that we have in healthcare, we inherited that from the, from the years of uh, where the most significant problem people brought us is some sort of infection. Um, the challenge for the clinician is to diagnose the infection, prescribe the right antibiotic, the patient's out of there, you can do it in a couple of minutes. That's not a problem. The, 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 the graph that, that, that Gregor showed with, where the majority of the adults are gonna live with conditions we cannot fix requires a different kind of response. So not only an extended team response, but also a response in which relationships become much more important than the transactional aspects of it. And so that's one part. The second part is, has to do with the, no, the, the no, notion of time itself. Um, uh, and I mentioned this in, a, in the previous session. When you spend time in, a, in where you're very present with maybe somebody you love or, or friends you haven't seen in a while, and you spend time with them, that time flies. It's just the perception of the longitudinality of time, that the continuity of time gets broken, and just all of a sudden time begins to get deeper, denser. And, and you sort of wake up from it and realize that time has gone. Or sometimes you feel that it's gone longer than it, than it has. Like this session was just 15 minutes, I don't know if you noticed. It was just very brief, but you feel like you've been here for an hour. <laughs> and so there is a, there's a potential of presence of the clinician and the patient in, in making the most of that time that needs to be exploited, but it's interrupted by the computer, by the checklist, by the form, by the thing. So everything conspires to those people, for those people to create that depth and, and, and of time and density of time. So I think we need to work on not only creating process of team, but also to get rid of the amount of time that it takes care of people like this, to the, and find through engineering and other approaches, what is the right of time that we can predict will take care of this person the next time they show up? And I think that's a significant challenge for our technology colleagues. So there's an irony about the fact we're talking about time, because time is up, I'm afraid. We have no time for any more, more questions. But uh, I'd really like to thank uh, both our speakers and for David as well. Thank you.